zinc oxide is a large band gap semiconductor, which means that it has a lot of applications in technology, uh, electronics, like LEDs and solar panels. And the reason that we would pick zinc oxide over other semiconductors is that it's relatively easy um, to synthesize and also cheap to synthesize. And it's also in more environmentally friendly than small particles. And lastly, it's zinc, zinc is diamagnetic, which means that you can characterize zinc containing compounds using NMR, which as a lot of you know is a very useful tool in chemistry. So the purpose behind my specific research was to create a P-type zinc oxide compound. And the reason this is important is because in semiconductor chemistry you need both N-type and P-type, and those just uh, correspond to negative and positive type. And negative type is has already been uh, created in bulk, but we were trying to figure out a way to create uh, P-type zinc oxide in bulk. And the way that you do that, by the way, is to introduce um, an atom in there that has fewer electrons than oxygen, which nitrogen is an example of that. And the overall product has fewer electrons and thus it we wanted to establish a reliable synthesis, one that could be repeated. So we were using single source precursors in this format, zinc acetate amine. And an amine is just a compound that contains them. And then we wanted to relate uh, the precursors that we used to the zinc oxide that we ended up with, um, with the crystal structure composition and electron. The way that we made our precursors is we took zinc acetate dihydrate and added um, different amines to it, and it ends up attaching to the zinc. And the most promising precursors that we found uh, were these tris, benzylamine, butylamine, ethylene diamine, and ammonia. Uh, these ones were just easiest to work with. Um, the best so now that we now that we uh, made the precursors, we wanted to figure out a little bit more about them. So we analyzed them through thermogravimetric analysis. And basically, this is just a fancy way of saying you measure the mass of the sample as you increase the temperature. And what happens is it starts out at a specific mass, and then as it gets a higher temperature, a lot of the stuff evaporates off until it flatlines. And this flatline, what's happening is this is pure zinc oxide with a little bit of nitrogen in it. And the equation's a little bit off, but you can see that whatever oxygen isn't in there is replaced by the nitrogen from the original precursor. And what we see here is that most of these precursors uh, become zinc oxide around maybe 500, 600, except for the tris compound. Um, it kind of lingers for a long time and never really reaches that flat line in argon, but when we do TTA in air, it reaches a flat line just like the rest of them, uh, just a little bit later. So what we did with that is we thought if we can decompose these precursors using heat, um, maybe we could make bulk amounts of powder through pyrolysis, which is the same thing. It's just decomposing these molecules away. So based on the TGA results, we thought that 650 to 750 degrees Celsius would be a good range of temperature to do that. Uh, for about two hours, we heated the compounds, and we did it in both an inert atmosphere and air. And what we found is that uh, in both atmospheres, we did yield zinc oxide. So that's not the only way that you can take a precursor to zinc oxide. Another way that we did it was through the salt gel synthesis process. And basically what you do here is you dissolve your precursor in deionized water, and then you progressively add uh, base to it until the pH reaches around 10. And at that point, zinc oxide starts to precipitate out of the solution. And the hope is that some of the nitrogen from the original precursor uh, will be trapped in the zinc oxide part that you will get nitrogen-soaked zinc oxide. So the way 
we found out if we did in fact get zinc oxide was through powder x-ray diffra diffraction. And it's used to determine purity, phase, and particle size in uh, crystals and zinc oxide. These are crystalline structures that we can use it for this. And our results from this showed that we did in fact get phase pure bursite zinc oxide. So this is a graph of an SRD. And the peaks that you're seeing are characteristic of zinc oxide. So this shows that we did, in fact, get zinc oxide like we expected. Uh, the only thing that's a little weird about this one is that the, the top one, Tris, um, the peaks are not as sharp as the other compounds. And we think this is because this is the compound that kind of was fading on the PGA. It never really became pure at the temperature that we ended up hydrolyzing it at. So we think that it may just not have um, fully purified so that it wasn't quite as good of a graph as the other one. And in air, when it did finally reach a flat line, uh, we see that it's just as pure as the other one. We also did XRD of the zinc oxide that we got through the salt gel process, and that also shows that we got zinc oxide. So, after that, we decided to look at the shape of the crystals. So we did that through scanning electron microscopy. And we found that there are a couple factors that affected the size and morphology of the crystals uh, once we decayed them. These were the annealing conditions that we used uh, after the salt gel when we heated up just to get rid of the water. Uh, that's the annealing condition. And the rate of sodium hydroxide addition during the salt gel synthesis. And also, which precursor you use. They all have different amine bonding to them. So these are some SEM images. As you can see, there's quite a bit of diversity in the morphology and size of the final zinc oxide crystals. Um, ethylene diamine creates those really cool rods. Uh, the tris kind of has more spheres, and the ammonia has some diagonal um, columns. So, shows that we, they are all zinc oxide, but they have significantly different morphologies and sizes. We also characterize all of our powders through X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. This is just a form of elemental analysis. It shows you the percentage of each element that you have in your compound. So what it told us is that for the varying precursors, this is how much nitrogen we actually ended up doping. So Tris, the one that we saw never really purified, not everything uh, evaporated off, that one we actually got the most nitrogen in, which kind of makes sense. And the other ones besides benzyl were pretty low. So what this told us is that we couldn't really use the zinc oxide in the way that we thought we were going to use it. We thought it was going to be more of an electronic use, um, seeing the electronic properties. But when it's such a low level of doping, that. So the conclusions that we have are that we did, in fact, uh, do what we set out to do as far as creating a reliable synthesis for the precursors. We were able to characterize those and find six that work really well. Um, they are soluble in many solvents. They yield an X-ray quality crystals. And both the processes, the bulk pyrolysis and the salt gel synthesis, created um, zinc oxide like we expected. And probably the most interesting part is that they, based on the amine and some other factors, the size and morphology of the zinc oxide crystals were even different. But as I mentioned earlier, there's a lack of significant levels of doping. So some future goals that we have for the research are to explore different amines um, and see if they have even more varying size and morphology. And we'd like to discontinue the uh, precursor, um, the way that we synthesized it, and just do a single cell, single step salt gel synthesis. And then we also want to figure out some way that we can use these particles because they, they're not going to be able to be used the way we thought they were. So some possibilities are a catalyst and biodiesel synthesis. Um, as Aaron talked about earlier, uh, zinc oxide is a photodegrader, and he showed that the morphology has an effect on that photodegradation. So there's, there are
there are uses for this, just not uh, as we originally intended. I'd like to thank um, the National Science Foundation grants, uh, Murdoch, Idaho State Grant Consortium, NASA, NEO, and my advisor, and previous workers on the team. Dr. Jason comes to this <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.